Welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I am Johannes Vermorel, and today I will be presenting the supply chain scientist. From the perspective of the quantitative supply chain, the supply chain scientist is the person, or possibly the small group of persons, in charge of spearheading the supply chain initiative. The, this person oversees uh, crafting and later maintaining the numerical recipes that generate the decisions of interest. This person is also in charge of providing all the necessary evidence to the rest of the company, proving that the generated decisions are sound. Indeed, the motto of the quantitative supply chain is to make the most of what modern hardware and modern software have to offer to supply chains. However, the disincarnate uh, flavor of this perspective is naive. Human intelligence is still uh, the cornerstone of the world undertaking and due to a variety of reasons cannot yet be nicely packaged as far as supply chain is concerned. The goal of this lecture is to understand um, why and how the role of the supply chain scientist um, has become during the last decade a, a time-tested solution to make the most of modern software for supply chain purposes. Achieving this goal starts with understanding what the great bottlenecks that modern software is still facing when attempting um, to automate supply chain decisions. Based on this newfound understanding, we will introduce the role of the supply chain scientist that is, for all intent and purposes, an answer to those bottlenecks. And finally, we will see how this role reshapes in small and bigger ways uh, the company as a role. Um, indeed, the supply chain scientist cannot operate as a silo within the company just like the scientists must cooperate with the rest of the company to achieve anything, the rest of the company must also cooperate with the scientists for um, this to happen. Before proceeding any further, I would like to reiterate a disclaimer that I made in the very first lecture of this series. The present lecture is almost entirely based on um, a somewhat unique, decade-long experiment conducted at LOCAD, an enterprise software vendor that precisely specializes in um, supply chain optimization. All those lectures have been shaped uh, by the journey of LOCAD, uh, but when it comes to the role of the supply chain scientist, the bond is even stronger. To a large extent, um, the journey of LOCAD, um, the journey of LOCAD itself can be read through the lenses of our gradual discovery of um, the role of the supply chain scientist. This process is still ongoing. Uh, for example, we only gave up uh, about five years ago uh, on the mainstream data scientist perspective um, with the introduction of programming paradigms uh, for learning and optimization purposes. LOCAD presently employs three dozen supply chain scientists. Um, our most capable scientists through their track record um, have become trusted with um, decisions on a large scale. Some of them are individually responsible for parameters that exceed um, half a billion dollar worth of inventory. This trust extends to a wide variety of decisions, such as purchase orders, production orders, um, inventory allocation orders, or uh, pricing. As you might surmise, um, this trust had to be earned. Um, indeed, very few companies would even trust their own employees with such powers, let alone a, a third-party vendor like LOCAD. Um, earning this degree of trust is a process that typically takes years, um, irrespective of the technological means. Yet, a decade later, LOCAD is growing faster than it ever did in its early years, and a sizable portion of this growth comes from um, our existing customers who are widening 
the scope of the decisions trusted to LOCAD. This brings me back to my initial point. This lecture almost certainly comes with all sorts of biases. I have tried to broaden um, this perspective through similar experiences outside LOCAD. However, there is not that much to be told on that front. Um, to my knowledge, there are a few tech giant companies, more specifically a few um, giant e-commerce companies that achieve um, a degree of decision automation that is comparable to the one that LOCAD achieves. However, those giants are typically throwing two orders of magnitude more resources uh, than what regular large companies uh, can afford with engineering headcounts in the hundreds. Those approaches are wasteful. It remains unclear to me whether they would work at all in um, companies that are not exceedingly profitable otherwise. The payroll costs um, alone are so staggering that they may very well exceed the benefits brought by a better execution of the supply chain. Furthermore, attracting engineering talent on such a scale also become a challenge of its own. Um, hiring one um, talented software engineer is difficult enough. Hiring 100 of them requires a, very, a fairly remarkable employer brand. Fortunately, the perspective presented today is much leaner. Many supply chain initiatives um, carried out by LOCAD are done with a, a single supply chain scientist with a second one acting as a substitute. Moreover, uh, beyond payroll savings, um, our experience indicate that there are some substantial um, supply chain benefits associated with a smaller headcount. The mainstream um, supply chain perspective adopts the stance of applied mathematics. Methods and algorithms are presented in a manner that remove entirely the human operator from um, the picture. For example, the safety stock formula and the economic order quantity formula are presented as a pure matter of applied mathematics. Um, the identity of the person wielding this formula his skills or his background, for example, um, is not only inconsequential, but it does not even belong to the presentation. More generally, this tense is largely adopted in uh, supply chain textbooks and consequently in supply chain software. It certainly feels uh, more objective uh, to remove the human component from the picture. After all, the validity of a theorem does not de depend on the um, person enunciating the proof. And likewise, the performance of an algorithm uh, does not depend on the person who uh, uh, end up pressing the last keystroke of its implementation. Thus, making the domain as impersonal as possible may seem uh, desirable um, to achieve a superior form of rationality. My Proposition is that distance is naive. This is um, another. This is yet another instance of naive rationalism. The proposition that I am defending is subtle yet important. I am not arguing that the outcome of a numerical recipe depends on the person who ultimately runs the recipe. Uh, no that the uh, character of a mathematician has anything to do with the validity of his theorems. Uh, my proposition is that the intellectual stance associated with this perspective is inappropriate to approach supply chains. A real-world supply chain recipe is a complex piece of craftsmanship. The author of the recipe isn't nearly as neutral or irrelevant as it may seem. Let's illustrate this point by considering two identical numerical recipes that only differ in the naming of their variables. At the numerical level, the two recipes deliver identical outputs. Um, however, the first recipe 
has well-chosen, meaningful, viable names, while the second recipe has cryptic, inconsistent names. In production, the second recipe, the one with the cryptic, inconsistent, viable names, is a disaster waiting to happen. Every evolution, every bug fix um, to be applied to the second recipe will cost um, orders of magnitude more effort compared to the same task uh, to be accomplished on the first recipe. In fact, viable naming woos are so frequent and so severe that many software engineering textbooks dedicate a whole chapter to this um, single question. Neither mathematics, uh, algorithmics, nor statistics say anything about the adequacy of viable names. The adequacy of those names lies obviously in the eye of the beholder. Thus, although we have two numerically identical recipes, one is deemed far superior to the other for seemingly um, subjective reasons. The proposition that I'm defending um, here is that there is rationality to be found in those subjective concerns as well. Um, those concerns should not be dismissed right off the bat for being dependent on a subject, a person. On the contrary, the low-cad experience indicates that um, given the same software tools, the same mathematical instruments, the same library of algorithms, certain supply chain scientists achieve superior results. In fact, the identity of the scientist in charge is one of the best predictors we have for the degree of success of the initiative. Thus, assuming that innate talent cannot entirely explain those discrepancies, we should, on the contrary, embrace those elements that contribute to the success of uh, the initiative, whether those elements um, appear to be objective or subjective. This is why at LOCAD um, we have put during the last decades a lot of effort um, into refining how we approach the role of the supply chain scientist, um, which is precisely the topic of um, the present lecture. The nuances associated with the position of um, the supply chain scientist are not to be underestimated. The magnitude of improvements brought by those subjective pieces are comparable um, uh, to the one brought by our most notable technological achievements. This uh, series of lectures is intended, uh, among other things, as training materials for the supply chain scientists of LOCAD. Um, however, I also hope that those lectures may be of interest to a much wider audience of supply chain practitioners or even supply chain students. I'm trying to keep those lectures somewhat decoupled, uh, but to truly understand what those scientists are dealing with, uh, it probably makes sense to watch those lectures in sequence. In the first chapter, we have seen um, why supply chains must become programmatic uh, and why it is highly desirable to be able to put a numerical recipe in production. The ever-increasing complexity of the supply chains themselves and makes automation more pressing than ever. In addition, there is also a financial imperative to make the supply chain practice a capitalistic undertaking. The second chapter is dedicated to methodologies. Indeed, supply chains are um, competitive systems. This combination defeats naive methodologies. Although the present lecture isn't listed as part of the second chapter, the role of the scientist can be seen as an antidote to the naive applied mathematics methodology. The third chapter surveys the problems, putting aside the solutions through um, supply chain personnel. This chapter uh, attempts to characterize the classes of decision-making changes um, that have to be addressed. This chapter shows that simplistic perspectives like picking the right stock quantity for every SKU don't fit real-world situations. There is invariably a deepness in the form of the decision. The fourth chapter surveys the elements that are required to apprehend um, a modern practice of um, the supply chain when, where um, 
software elements are ubiquitous. Um, those elements are fundamental in order to understand the broader context in which um, the digital supply chain operate. Um, indeed, many supply chain textbooks uh, implicitly assume um, their techniques and formulas to operate in some sort of vacuum. Uh, this is not the case. Uh, chapter 5 and 6 are dedicated to predictive modeling and decision making respectively. Those chapters um, cover the smart bits of the numerical recipe featuring machine learning and mathematical optimization. Notably, um, those chapters collect techniques um, that have uh, been found to be working well in the hands of supply chain scientists. And finally, the seventh and present chapter is dedicated to the execution of a quantitative supply chain initiative. We have seen what it takes to kick off an initiative while laying out the proper foundations. We have seen how to cross the finish line and put the uh, numerical recipe in production. Today, we will see what sort of person it takes to make the whole thing happen. Today, we will start by revisiting the problem. What is it the, the, the role that the role of the scientist is trying to solve? Uh, academic literature is full of solutions waiting for their problems. Let's avoid this pitfall by starting with some proper due diligence. Um, then we will review the job of the supply chain scientist per se. Uh, this includes the mission, the deliverable, the scope, the daily routine, plus a few other um, items of interest. The, this job description reflects the present day practice at LOCAD. A new position within the company creates a series of concerns. So scientists uh, need to be hired, trained, reviewed, retained. Uh, we will approach those concerns from the perspective of human resources. Also, the scientist is expected to cooperate with other departments within the company um, beyond his own supply chain department. We'll see what sort of interaction uh, are expected to be uh, between the scientist and IT, finance, and even the leadership of the company. Finally, the uh, scientist also represents an opportunity for the company to modernize its staff to do more, to do it better, and to do it with less. This modernization is uh, the most difficult part of the journey as it is far more difficult to remove a position that has ceased to be relevant rather than introducing a new one. The challenge that we have set for ourselves in this series of lectures is the systematic improvement of supply chains through quantitative methods. The general gist of um, this approach is to make the most of what modern computing software has uh, to offer to supply chain. However, we need to clarify what still belongs to the realm of human intelligence and uh, what can be successfully automated away. Um, the line of demarcation between the two is um, still very much dependent on um, the technology. A superior technology is expected to uh, mechanize a broader spectrum of decisions and deliver better outcomes as well. Um, from a supply chain perspective, it means taking more diverse decisions, such as pricing decisions in addition to inventory replenishment decisions. And um, it means producing better decisions, uh, that is, decisions that further improve the profitability of the company. The role of the scientist is, is the embodiment of this frontier between uh, human intelligence and automation. Um, while routine announcement about artificial intelligence may give the impression that human intelligence is on the verge of um, uh, being uh, automated away as a whole, uh, my understanding of the state of the art indicates that general artificial intelligence remains distant. Indeed, human insights are still very much needed when it comes to the design of quantitative method of supply chain relevance. 
Establishing even a basic supply chain strategy remains largely beyond um, the realm of what software can deliver. More generally, we don't have yet technologies capable of tackling badly framed problems or unidentified problems, which are commonplace in supply chain. However, once a, a narrow, uh, well-specified problem has uh, been isolated, it is conceivable to have an automated process learn its resolution uh, and even to automate this resolution with um, little or no human oversight. This perspective is not novel. Uh, for example, anti-spam filters have become broadly adopted. Those filters are accomplishing a challenging task, that is, sorting the relevant from the irrelevant. However, the design of the next generation of filters is still largely left to humans, even if newer data can be used to update those filters. Uh, indeed, spammers, uh, the people who want to circumvent anti-spam filters, keeps inventing new methods that defeat plain data-driven updates of those filters. Thus, while human insight are still needed to engineer the automation, it is not clear why a software vendor, Locat, for example, uh, could not engineer a, a grand supply chain engine that would happen to address all those changes. Certainly, the economics of software are very much in favor of engineering such a grand supply chain engine. Even if the initial investment is steep, as software can be replicated at a negligible cost, the vendor would make a fortune um, in licensing fees by uh, reselling this grand engine to a large number of companies. Locad, uh, back in 2008, did embark on such a journey of creating a grand engine that could have been deployed as a packaged software product. More precisely, Locad was, um, at the time, focusing on a grand forecasting engine rather than a grand supply chain engine. Yet, despite those comparatively more modest ambition, and as, as forecasting is only a small portion of the world supply chain challenge, Locad failed through and through at creating such a grand forecasting engine. The quantitative supply chain perspective presented in this series of lectures um, arose from the ashes of this grand engine ambition. Supply chain wise, um, it turned out that there are three great bottlenecks to be addressed. We will see why this grand engine was doomed from day one, and we are still most likely decades away of such an engineering feat. The applicative landscape of the typical supply chain is a jungle that has grown effusively over the last two or three decades. This landscape is not a um, jardin à la française, a, a, a French formal garden with neat geometrical lines and well-trimmed bushes. It's a jungle, both uh, vibrant but also full of forms and hostile fauna. Um, more, more seriously, supply chains are the product of their digital history. There might be multiple semi-redundant ERPs, um, half-finalized homegrown um, customizations, botch integration, especially with systems um, originating from uh, acquired companies, and overlapping software platforms that compete for the same functional areas. The idea that some grand engine could just be plugged in is um, delusional considering the present state of software technologies. Bringing together all the systems that operate the supply chain is a substantial undertaking entirely dependent on human engineering efforts. The LOCAT collective experience indicate that the data, that data wrangling, you know, that, that, uh, represent at least three quarter of um, the overall technical effort associated with a supply chain initiative. In contrast, crafting the smart bits uh, of the numerical recipe, the forecasting, the optimization does not amount to more than a few percent of the overall effort. Thus, the availability of a packaged grand engine is largely inconsequential, either in, in cost or in delays. It would take 
a built-in human level intelligence for this engine to automatically uh, plug itself into the sort of haphazard IT landscape as commonly found in supply chain. Furthermore, any kind of grand engine make this um, undertaking even more challenging due to its very existence. Instead of dealing with one complex system, the applicative landscape, uh, we have two uh, complex systems, the applicative landscape plus the grand engine. The complexity of plumbing those two systems is not the sum of their respective complexities, but rather th the product of those complexities. Furthermore, the impact of this complexity on engineering cost is highly nonlinear. Um, this point had already been made in the first chapter of this series of lectures. Thus, the first great bottleneck for supply chain optimization is the setup of uh, the numerical recipe that requires a dedicated engineering effort. This bottleneck largely eliminates the benefits that could be conceivably associated with any kind of package grand uh, supply chain engine. While the setup uh, requires a substantial engineering effort, it might just be a one-time investment akin to um, a paying an entry ticket. Unfortunately, supply chains are living things uh, under constant evolution. The day when the supply chain stops changing is the day when the company um, goes bankrupt. Change, changes are both internal and external. I internally, um, the applicative landscape is changing continuously. Companies um, could not even freeze their applicative landscape even if they wanted to. Indeed, many uh, upgrades are mandated by enterprise software vendors and ignoring those mandates would relieve the vendors from their contractual obligations, uh, which is not an acceptable outcome. Uh, beyond those purely technical updates, uh, any sizable supply chain is bound to phase in and phase out software pieces um, all the time as the company itself is changing. Externally, uh, markets are continuously changing as well. New competitors, new sales channel, new potential suppliers emerge all the time. Some are disappearing too. Regulations keeps changing. Um, while algorithms may automatically capture some of the easy changes, like the demand growing for a class of products, we don't have yet algorithms to cope when market changes in kind rather than just changing in magnitude. The very problems uh, that supply chain is trying to address uh, is um, uh, uh, those problems are themselves changing. If the software um, supposedly in charge of the optimization of the supply chain fails at um, dealing with those changes, then employees fall back to their spreadsheets. Spreadsheets might be crude, but at the very least, employees may keep them relevant to the task at hand. Anecdotally, uh, the vast majority of um, the supply chains are still operating uh, under spreadsheets. Uh, I mean, at the decision level, not at the transactional level. This is the living proof that um, the software maintenance has failed. Since the 1980s, um, enterprise software vendors have been delivering products, software products, to automate supply chain decisions. Most companies operating large supply chains have already deployed several of those solutions um, uh, during the last uh, few decades. Yet, employees did invariably revert to their spreadsheets, um, proving that even if the setup was originally deemed a success, something went wrong with the maintenance. Maintenance is the second great bottleneck uh, of supply chain optimization. The recipe requires an active maintenance, even if um, the execution can be largely left uh, unattended. At this point, um, we have shown that the, so the, the supply chain optimization, in order to be automated, uh, requires not only initial 
uh, software engineering resources, but ongoing software engineering resources. As um, already pointed out uh, in this series of lectures, nothing short of programmatic capabilities um, are realistically capable of approaching the diversity of problems faced by real-world supply chains. Spreadsheets do count as programmable tools. The expressiveness of spreadsheets as opposed to buttons and menus is what makes them um, so attractive to supply chain practitioners. Um, as software engineering resources have to be secured, uh, in most companies, it feels natural to call upon the IT department. Unfortunately, uh, supply chain is not the sole department to end up with this line of thinking. Every single department, sales, marketing, finance, end up realizing that um, automating their respective decision-making processes do require software engineering resources. Furthermore, IT must also deal with all the transactional layer and all its underlying um, infrastructure as well. Uh, as a result, most companies operating large supply chain nowadays have um, their IT department buried under years of backlog. Thus, expecting the IT department to allocate further ongoing resources to the supply chain is only making the backlog worse. The option of allocating more resources to the IT department has already been explored, and it is, all, it is usually no longer viable. Um, those companies are already uh, facing severe diseconomies of scale when it comes to the IT department. The IT backlog represents the third great bottleneck for supply chain optimization. Um, ongoing engineering resources are needed, but the bulk of those resources cannot come from IT. Uh, some support from IT can be envisioned, but uh, it has to be a low-key affair. Those three um, great bottlenecks uh, define why uh, or explain why a specific role is needed. Um, the supply chain scientist is the name that we are giving to those ongoing software engineering resources needed to automate the supply chain, uh, the mundane uh, decisions, the, the mundane decision making processes of the supply chain. Let's proceed with a more precise definition based on the uh, low CAD practice. The mission of the supply chain scientist is to craft numerical recipes that generate the mundane decisions that are needed daily to operate the supply chain. The work of the scientist um, starts with the database extracts collected all over the applicative landscape. The scientist is literally expected to code the recipe that crunches those database extracts and um, bring those recipes to production. The scientist um, takes full responsibility for the quality of the decision generated by the recipe. The decisions aren't generated by some sort of ambient system. Those decisions are the direct expression of the insights of the scientist conveyed through a recipe. Um, this single aspect is a critical departure from what is usually understood as the role of the data scientist. However, the mission doesn't stop there. The supply chain scientist is expected to uh, be able to present um, evidence supporting every single decision generated by the recipe. Again, it is not some sort of opaque system that is responsible for the decisions. It's a person, the scientist. Um, the scientist should be able to meet with the lead of the supply chain or even with the CEO and provide a convincing rationale for any decision that has been generated by the recipe. As a rule of thumb, if the scientist isn't in a position to actually do a lot of damage to the company, then something is wrong. Let me immediately clarify that I'm not advocating granting anyone, and certainly not the scientist, large powers without supervision or accountability. 
I am merely pointing out uh, the obvious. Uh, if you don't have the power to negatively impact your company, no matter how poorly you perform, certainly you don't have the power to positively impact your company, no matter how well you perform either. Large companies are unfortunately risk adverse by, by nature. Thus, it is very tempting to replace um, the scientist with an analyst. Um, contrary to the scientist in charge of the decisions themselves, um, the analyst is only responsible for shedding some lights here and there. Um, the analyst is mostly harmless and can't do much beyond wasting his own peril plus some computing resources. However, being harmless is not what the role of the supply chain scientist is about. Let, let's discuss for a second about the term supply chain scientist. Um, this terminology is unfortunately imperfect. I originally coined this expression supply chain scientist as a variation of data scientist about a decade ago. At the time, the idea was to brand this role as a variation of data scientist, but with a strong supply chain specialization. The insight about uh, specialization was correct, but the one about data science was not. Um, I will be revisiting this point at the end of the lecture. Supply chain engineer might have been a better wording. Uh, it emphasized a desire to master and control the domain as opposed to a pure understanding. However, uh, engineers, as commonly understood, uh, are not expected to be on the forefront of the action. The proper term uh, would probably have been supply chain quant, uh, as in quantitative supply chain practitioners. In finance, a quant or quantitative trader is a specialist who leverages algorithms and quantitative methods to make trading decisions. Quants can make uh, the bank vastly profitable or conversely vastly unprofitable. Uh, the human intelligence is magnified through um, machines, uh, the good and the bad. In any case, it will be up, uh, I guess, to the community at large to decide what is the proper terminology. Analyst, scientist, engineer, operative, quant. Um, for the sake of consistency, I will keep using the term scientist in the rest of this lecture. The primary deliverable for the scientist is a piece of software. More precisely, uh, it's the numerical recipe in charge of generating daily the, all the supply chain decisions of interest. This recipe is a collection of all the scripts involved from the earliest stages of the data preparation to the final stages of the corporate validation of the decisions themselves. This recipe must be production grade. Um, being production grade means that the recipe can run unattended and that the decisions are, that it generates are trusted by default. Naturally, this trust had to be earned in the first place and some ongoing supervision must ensure that this level of trust remains warranted over time. Delivering a production grade recipe is, uh, a fundamental, is fundamental in order to turn uh, the supply chain practice into a productive asset. This angle has already been discussed in uh, the previous lecture, product-oriented delivery. Um, beyond this recipe, there are numerous secondary deliverables. Some of them are also software, even if they don't directly contribute to the generation of the decisions. This includes, for example, all the instrumentation that the scientist needs uh, to introduce in order to craft and later to maintain the recipe itself. Um, some other items are intended for colleagues within uh, the company. This includes all the documentation of the initiative itself and of the recipe. Indeed, the source code of the recipe uh, answers the how, how is it done. Um, however, the source code does not enter the why, why is it done. The why must be documented. Frequently, the correctness of the recipe hinges on uh, some subtle understanding of the intent 
Also, the delivered documentation must facilitate as much as possible the graceful transition from one scientist to the next, even if the former scientist isn't available to support the process. Um, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Uh, we can hope to have the scientist um, around to train his successor as it is the most desirable situation. However, hope isn't a plan. The plan is to maintain an up-to-date documentation that can readily support such a transition at any point of time. Such a documentation can take many forms. Um, at LOCAD, our standard procedure consists of, pro uh, of producing and maintaining a grand book of the initiative uh, referred to as the GPM, the Joint Procedure Manual. This manual is not only um, a complete operating manual of the recipe, uh, but also a collection of all the strategic insights that underlie the modeling choices made by the scientist. At the technical level, the work of the scientist starts from the point of extraction of the raw data and the work ends uh, at the, with the generation of the finalized supply chain decisions. The scientist must operate from raw data as extracted from the existing business systems, as each uh, business system tends to have its own technological stack, the extraction itself is usually best delegated to IT specialists. It is indeed uh, not reasonable to expect that the scientist to become proficient with half a dozen SQL dialects or half a dozen API technologies merely to gain access to um, the business data. However, nothing should be expected from those IT specialists except the raw data extracts, neither data transformation nor data preparation. The extracted data made accessible uh, to the scientist must be as close as possible to the data as it presents itself within the business systems. At the other end of um, the pipeline, the recipe crafted by uh, the scientist must end up generating the finalized decisions. The elements associated with the rollout of the decisions are not under the purview of the scientist. They are obviously important, but they are also largely independent uh, from the decision itself. For example, if we are considering purchase orders, then establishing um, the final quantities lies within the scope of the scientist, but generating the PDF file, uh, the order document expected by the supplier does not. Despite those limits, the scope is somewhat large. As a result, um, it is tempting, but also misguided, to fragment this scope into a series of subscope. In larger companies, this temptation becomes very strong. It must be resisted nonetheless. Fragmenting the scope is the surest way to create um, problems, numerous problems. Upstream, if someone attempts to help the scientists by messaging the, the, the input data, then this attempt invariably end up in garbage in, garbage out problems. Business systems are complex enough. Transforming the data beforehand um, does nothing but add uh, an extra accidental layer of complexity. Um, midstream, if someone attempts to help the scientist by taking care of a challenging piece of the recipe, like forecasting, then the scientist end up fac facing um, a black box in the middle of his own recipe. Such a black box undermines um, the white boxing efforts of the scientist. And, and downstream, uh, if someone attempts to help the scientist by re-optimizing further the decisions, then this attempt invariably create confusion. Um, those two layered uh, optimization logics may even work uh, at cross purposes. This does not imply that the scientist has to work alone a team of scientists can be formed, but the scope remains. If a team is formed, then there must be a collective ownership of the recipe. This implies, for example, that if a defect uh, of the recipe is identified, then any member of the team should be able to step in and fix it. 
The look at experience indicate that a healthy mix for um, a supply chain scientist involves spending 40% of his time coding, 30% dialoguing with the rest of the company, and finally, 30% writing documents, training materials, and um, exchanging with fellow supply chain practitioners, um, or fellow, sorry, supply chain scientists. Um, uh, coding is obviously needed to implement the recipe itself. However, um, once the recipe is in production, most of the coding efforts are directed not at the recipe itself, um, not anymore, but rather at its instrumentation. In order to improve the recipe, the scientist needs further insights, and in turn, those insights require dedicated instrumentation that must be implemented. Um, dialoguing with the rest of the company is fundamental. Unlike SNOP, the purpose of those discussions is not to steer the forecast upward or downward. It's about making sure that the modeling choices embedded into the recipe still faithfully reflect um, both the strategy in the company and all its operational constraints. Finally, nurturing the institutional knowledge uh, um, that the company has about supply chain optimization, either by direct training of um, the scientist himself or through the production of documents intended for colleagues is critical. The performance of the recipe is indeed, um, to a large extent, the reflection of the competency of the scientist. Having access to peers and seeking feedback is unsurprisingly, one of the most efficient means to improve the competency of the scientist. The, the biggest difference between a supply chain scientist as envisioned by LOCAD and a mainstream data scientist is the personal commitment to real-world results. It may seem a small, inconsequential thing, but my experience says otherwise. At LOCAD, a decade ago, we did learn the hard way uh, that commitment to uh, the delivery of a production grade recipe was not a given. On the contrary, the default attitude of the people trained as data scientists appears to be treating production as a secondary concern. The data scientist has indeed been trained in data science. The data, science, the data scientist, you know, the mainstream data scientist, expects to manage the smart bits like machine learning and mathematical optimization. Dealing with all the random trivia that comes with the real world supply chain is too frequently perceived as beneath the supply chain, uh, the, the data scientist. Um, yet, uh, the commitment to a production grade recipe implies dealing with the most random things. For example, in July 2021, many European countries suffered uh, catastrophic floods. A client of us based in Germany had half of its warehouses flooded. The supply chain scientist had, uh, in charge of this account had to re-engineer the recipe pretty much overnight to make the most of this severely degraded situation. The fix wasn't some sort of grand machine learning algorithm, but a hastily coded heuristics. Conversely, if the supply chain scientist does not own the decision, um, then as a rule of thumb, this person won't be able to craft a production grade recipe. It is a matter of um, psychology. Delivering a production grade recipe requires an immense intellectual effort. The level of attention it commands is staggering. Um, stakes have to be real for, uh, to get this level of focus from an employee. As we have clarified what the job of the supply chain scientist entail, let's clarify how it works from a human resources perspective. First, among corporate concerns, the scientists must report to the head of the supply chain, or at the very least, to someone who qualifies as senior supply chain leadership. It does not matter if the scientist is internalized or externalized, as it is usually the case with low CAD. The point remains, the scientist must be under the direct supervision 
of someone who wields the power of a supply chain executive. One common mistake is indeed to have the scientists to report to the head of IT or to the head of data analytics as crafting a recipe is a coding exercise. The supply chain leadership might not feel fully comfortable with supervising such an undertaking, yet um, this is wrong. The scientist needs the supervision of someone who can approve whether the generated decisions are acceptable or not, or who can, at the very least, make this approval happen. Um, putting the scientist anywhere but under the direct supervision of the supply chain leadership is the recipe to endlessly operate uh, through prototypes that never make their way to production. Um, the role in, in this situation, uh, the role reverts invariably to the one of an analyst um, and thus we end up giving up on the initial ambitions uh, of the quantitative supply chain initiative. The very best scientists generate outside, uh, outsized returns compared to the average ones. This has been um, the local experience and it mirrors um, the pattern that has been identified decades ago in the software industry. Software companies have long observed that the very best software engineers have at least 10 times uh, more productivity than uh, the average ones and um, that m mediocre engineers even have a negative productivity, making the software worse for every hour that they spend on the code base. Um, in the case of the scientist, a superior competency only, uh, not only improves the productivity, but more importantly, it improves the end game supply chain performance as well. Um, we touched upon uh, this aspect earlier when discussing naive rationalism. Um, given the same um, software tools, the same mathematical instrument, two scientists do not achieve the same outcome. Um, thus, hiring someone who has the potential to become one of those very best scientists is of primary importance. The local experience based on hiring 50 plus uh, scientists indicates that unspecialized engineering profiles are usually quite good. Um, while it is counterintuitive, or at least it was to me, uh, people with formal training in data science, statistics, or computer science are typically not the best profile um, for supply chain scientists' positions. Those people um, too frequently overcomplicate uh, the recipe and uh, they don't pay nearly enough attention to the mundane but overly critical aspects of the supply chain. The ability to pay attention to a small mountain of haphazard details uh, and the ability to persevere endlessly while chasing some fringe numerical artifacts seems to be the leading qualities of the very best scientist. Um, anecdotally, at LOCAD, we have a good track records with young engineers who have spent a few years as auditors. Uh, in addition to the familiarity with corporate finance, it seems that auditors, at least the talented ones, develop a capacity to wade through an ocean of corporate records, which turn out to be um, fully aligned with the day-to-day -day reality of the supply chain scientist. While hiring ensures that recruits have the right potential, uh, the next step is to ensure that the recruits are properly trained. Um, the default position uh, of LOCAD is that we don't expect people to know anything about um, supply chain beforehand. Um, don't get me wrong, um, being knowledgeable on supply chain is certainly a plus. However, uh, academia remains somewhat deficient in this regard. Um, most supply chain degrees are all about management and leadership. But let's be real, if you're, under, um, if you're 23, unless you're a rare born leader, you're barely able to manage yourself, let alone manage a team. Um, I would personally expect um, uh, supply chain degrees to provide some proper foundations um, 
with topics like the one covered in the second, third or fourth chapters of this series of lectures. Yet, this is usually not the case, at least not yet. Um, instead, the only quantitative part of those degrees appears to be some um, applied mathematics trivia, like the safety stock formula, which is underwhelming at best. Thus, the supply chain scientist must be trained, and this burden falls on whoever ends up being um, his employer. Detailing what uh, such a training entails is beyond the scope of this lecture, although there are no grand secrets either. Um, for example, this series of lectures reflect the sort of training materials um, that are used at LOCAD. Reviewing the performance of the scientist is necessary for all sorts of obvious reasons, ranging from making sure that the, company, the money of the company is well spent to negotiating uh, whether um, this person uh, deserves to be promoted or not. Um, all the usual criterions apply, attitude, diligence, proficiency, etc. But there is one angle that is somewhat counterintuitive and yet critically important. The very best scientists manage to come up with resumes that um, almost let you forget the magnitude of the supply chain changes. The recipe is humming gently in the background. There is no firefighting anymore. When investigating, occasionally, a few decisions that turn out to cause some friction, the scientists provide convincing evidence that given the information that was available at the time, it was a sensible decision. Large companies tend to struggle with this perspective as success is expected to resonate through the organization. Talent is expected to be spectacular, to be newsworthy. However, in the case of supply chain, this is the opposite. True competency is about mastering the task so completely it looks uneventful boring even to observers. Thus, while reviewing um, a scientist, also look for uh, supply chain drama during the last year. The fewer, the better. It takes about six months to train a scientist to be able to maintain existing recipes while retaining the previous level of, uh, of, of supply chain performance. And it takes about two years to train a scientist to be able to implement a production grade recipe from scratch. Naturally, this assumes that the hiring process has managed to fetch high potential engineers in the first place. Um, thus, talent retention is critical even more so uh, as hiring experience supply chain scientist is not an option, at least not yet. Um, unfortunately, um, at least from the employer's perspective, Quantitative skills have been in high demand for the last decades, and this trend is unlikely to revert in the coming one. In France, uh, the median tenure for engineers under 30 in software and software adjacent fields is um, 14 months. Uh, France is not an outlier, and the outlook is similar in other Western countries. Uh, for example, the average um, employee tenures, the median uh, uh, employee tenures at Google is 16 months. In uh, contrast, LOCAD has uh, a median tenure about three years and a half, uh, while hiring almost exclusively from this segment, engineers under uh, uh, 30. Uh, and this achievement lies, um, I believe, in a single insight. Companies cannot bring happiness to their uh, employees, even the very best companies. Um, happiness lies beyond the realm of the corporation. However, Companies can certainly make their employees measurable. Uh, thus, my single piece of advice to prospective employers is that the path um, to the retention of the supply chain scientist is subtractive, not additive. It's not about the perks, not really assuming that salaries are in lines with market rates. It's about not driving your employees nuts through inane processes. Sanity goes a long way as far employee retention is concerned. Even a competent, experienced supply chain scientist cannot be expected to take over an existing recipe in two days. Um, the recipe not only reflects the unique um, strategy of the company, but it also reflects all the quirks of the supply chain of interest and all its 
applicative landscape. For any sizable supply chain, transitioning from one um, supply chain to the next should be expected to take about a month uh, in the best conditions. Thus, it, it is not a reasonable option for a sizable company to depend on a single uh, scientist. At, at LOCAD, our default practice is to ensure that at any point of time, there are two scientists who are readily proficient with any recipe used in production. We also try to adjust vacations accordingly to always maintain one scientist readily available, although there are periods, like Christmas, um, where leaves are bound to overlap. Uh, beside redundancy, the second most important piece in terms of continuity is um, the grand book of the initiative codenamed the Joint Pursuit Manual at LOCAD. Um, uh, those manuals are indeed at LOCAD jointly elaborated with our clients. Among other things, the manual is intended to facilitate unplanned transitions between scientists. Um, Murphy's Law very much applies. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong at some point. The manual is your insurance policy for continuity. The supply chain is gluing the company together to ensure uh, that the demand that has been generated by sales and marketing is properly serviced. The job of the scientist um, reflects this ambition and the scientist needs an unusual level of cooperation with multiple other departments in the company. Unusual, at least, compared to most other positions that involved a similar amount of coding. Um, first, the scientist is, is expected to maintain a low-key line of dialogue with IT. The proper uh, execution of the recipe is entirely dependent on the data extraction pipeline, which is left to the good care of IT. Um, the importance of the data pipeline has been discussed in the previous lecture of the seventh chapter. An unreliable pipeline will ruin all attempts at making um, th this recipe production grade. Yet, um, data perfection is not a reasonable expectation when it comes to a, a, a complex applicative landscape. Um, furthermore, as discussed previously, IT is the bottleneck of the company, even more so than the supply chain scientist himself. Thus, the scientist must uh, negotiate with IT a setup that is both good, uh, that is both good enough for supply chain purposes, but also simple enough to be maintained by IT. There is a relatively intense phase of interaction between IT and the scientist at the very beginning of the first quantitative supply chain initiative. During the first two or three months, the scientist he needs to interact with IT several times per week. Afterward, once the data extraction pipeline is in place, interaction becomes much less frequent, once per month or less. Um, besides solving the occasional glitch of the pipeline, this line of dialogue between IT and the scientist ensure that the scientist remains aware of the IT roadmap. Any software upgrade or replacement may require days of work, uh, even weeks, uh, if we're considering a larger system for the scientist in order to avoid any downtime of the recipe. Indeed, the recipe will have to be modified to accommodate the changes in the applicative landscape. The recipe, as implemented by the scientists, optimize dollars or euros of returns. We did already cover this aspect in the very first lectures of this series. However, the scientists should not be expected to decide how to model those costs and profits, while the scientists should be expected to propose some models to reflect um, the economic drivers. It's ultimately the role of finance to decide whether those uh, drivers are deemed correct or not. Many supply chain practices evade the problem by focusing on made-up percentages, such as service levels and forecast accuracies. However, those percentages have almost no correlation whatsoever with the financial health of the company. Thus, the, the scientists must routinely engage finance and have them challenge the modeling choices uh, and the modeling assumption that have made their way into the numerical recipe. 
financial modeling choices are transient to some extent as they reflect the strategy of the company, which changes over time. The scientist is also expected to craft some instrumentation attached to the recipe dedicated to uh, the finance department. This instrumentation um, could include, for example, uh, the maximal projected amount of working capital associated with the inventory uh, for the year to come. For a mid-size or large company, it's reasonable to put in place a quarterly review by an executive uh, from finance uh, of the work done by the supply chain scientist. Finally, one of the biggest threats to the validity of the recipe as implemented by the scientist is to betray the, accidentally the strategic intent of the company. This is the old story of people selling drills who do not realize that they are in the business of selling holes. Um, again, too many supply chain practices evade strategy like they evade finance by hiding behind percentages used as performance indicators. Worse, inflating or deflating the forecast, as sometimes done um, through SNOP, is absolutely not a substitute for a clarification of the strategic intent. Um, the scientist isn't in charge of the strategy of the company, but unless he gets it, um, the recipe will come out wrong. Um, there are just too many viables, too many possible modeling choices. The alignment with, um, of the strategy with the, stra uh, the, the alignment of the recipe with the strategy doesn't fall from the sky. It has to be engineered. The most direct way to assess whether the scientist understands the strategy is to have him re-explain the strategy to the leadership. Um, there are two reasons for having the scientist explain the strategy rather than doing the, it um, the other way around. First, any C-level executive is, um, the time of any C-level executive is precious. And as a rule of thumb, if a company is sizable, there should be other people capable of explaining the strategy to the scientist. If C-levels are the only ones capable of explaining what the strategy of the company is about, then arguably there are more pressing issues than nurturing the supply chain scientist. Second, by letting the scientist um, do the presentation of the, uh, of the strategy, it's easier to catch the misunderstandings. In theory, this piece of understanding is already written down uh, by the scientist in the manual of the initiative. However, my experience indicates that sea levels rarely, uh, can rarely afford the time it would take to go back and forth in writing over a piece of uh, operational documentation. A simple conversation expedites the process for both parties. Let's clarify that this meeting is not intended for the scientists to explain all there is to know about supply chain, the quantitative models, or whatever financial results have been achieved. The sole purpose of the discussion is to ensure uh, a proper understanding of the person holding the digital pen. All the other elements are important, but they can be communicated through the usual corporate channels. Even in a large company, it's reasonable to have the scientists face once in a year the CEO or whoever is effectively leading the relevant branch of activities. The benefits associated um, with a recipe that is more in tune with the intent of um, the leadership are vast and too easily underestimated. The path of the quantitative supply chain is a facet of the ongoing digital modernization of companies. Unfortunately, walking um, this path takes more than hiring a couple of supply chain scientists. This path requires some reorganization of the company itself. There is nothing really drastic about it, about those changes. Um, however, weeding out an obsolete practice is always an uphill battle, even more so if the company is large and ancient. When 
executed correctly, the productivity of a supply chain scientist is one or two orders of magnitude larger compared to the one of the mainstream supply uh, and demand planner. Um, as discussed previously, the local experience indicate that it's not out of the ordinary uh, to have a single scientist in charge of more than half a billion uh, euro or dollar worth of inventory. Thus, this begs the question of the ongoing role of um, the former planners. A drastic reduction of the supply chain account is possible. Um, some client companies of LOCAD who were historically under immense competitive pressure did take this approach and survived in part due to those savings. Um, most of our clients, however, are opting for a more gradual reduction of the headcount as planners naturally move, on, um, naturally move on to other positions. The planners who remain reorient their effort toward uh, customers and suppliers. Um, the feedback that they collect proves very useful to um, the supply chain scientist. Indeed, the work of the scientist is inward looking by nature. The recipe or operate over the data of the company. It is difficult to see what is simply absent. Also, um, tangentially, uh, many business voices have been advocating for a long time, um, forging stronger ties with both um, customers and suppliers. However, it is easier said than done, especially if efforts are routinely neutralized um, due to uh, ongoing firefighting reassuring customers, pressuring suppliers. Um, however, the scientists can provide much needed relief on both fronts. SNOP is the shorthand for sales and operation. It's a widespread practice intended to foster company-wide alignment through a shared demand forecast. However, no matter what the original ambitions may have been. All the SNOP processes that I've ever witnessed uh, were best characterized by an endless series of unproductive meetings. Except maybe ERP migrations and compliance, I can't think of any corporate practice that are as soul damaging as SNOP. The Soviet Union may have disappeared but the spirit of the ghost plan lives on through SNOP. Um, an in-depth critic of SNOP would deserve a lecture of its own. However, for the sake of concision, I will simply say that, um, the, uh, that a supply chain scientist is a superior alternative to SNOP in every dimension that matters. Unlike the supply chain scientist, SNOP is not grounded in real world decisions. And let's make no mistake here, the only thing that prevents a scientist from being one more agent of a bloated corporate bureaucracy is not his character or his competency. It's having some skin in the game through those real world decisions. Planners, inventory managers, Production managers are frequently big consumers of all sorts of business reports. Those reports are usually produced by enterprise software products, commonly referred to as business intelligence tools. Um, the typical supply chain practice consists of exporting a series of reports uh, into spreadsheets and then um, using a collection of spreadsheet formulas to blend all this information in order to semi-manually generate the decisions of interest. Yet, as we have seen, um, the recipe of the scientist replaces um, this combination of business intelligence plus spreadsheets. Furthermore, um, neither business intelligence nor spreadsheets are suitable to support the implementation of a recipe. Business intelligence lacks expressiveness. The relevant calculation cannot be expressed through this class of tools. Spreadsheets lacks maintainability, the design, and sometimes scalability, but mostly maintainability. The design of spreadsheets um, is largely incompatible with any kind of correctness by design, which is very much needed for supply chain purposes. In practice, the instrumentation of a recipe um, as implemented by the scientist, 
does include numerous business reports. Um, those reports do replace the one that were generated so far through business intelligence. Um, this evolution doesn't necessarily imply the end of business intelligence, as other departments may still benefit from this class of tools. However, as far as supply chain is concerned, the introduction of the scientist, you know, hails the end of the business intelligence era. If we put aside a few tech giants who can afford to throw hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of engineers at every software problem, the typical outcome of data science um, of data science teams in regular companies is dismal. Um, usually nothing of substance get ever accomplished by those teams. Um, however, data science, and I mean data science as a, form, as a corporate practice, data science is only the latest iteration of a series of corporate fraction, fashions. Um, in the 1970s, operational research was all the rage. In the 1980s, uh, rural engines and knowledge experts were all the rage. At the turn of the century, data mining and data miners were all the rage. Since uh, 20, the 2010s, uh, data science and data scientists are supposed to be the next best thing. All those corporate fashions follow the same pattern. A genuine uh, software innovation happened and people get over-enthusiastic about it. And those people decide to forcibly embed this piece of innovation into the company through the creation of a new dedicated department. The Parkinson law applies. It's always much easier to add divisions to an organization as opposed to modifying, let alone removing the existing ones. Um, Yet data science, again, as a corporate practice, fails because it is not firmly anchored in action. This makes all the difference between the supply chain scientist who is committed from day one to be responsible uh, for generating real-world decisions. For the IT department, if we can put aside egos and fiefdoms, the supply chain scientists represent a much better deal than the former status quo. Uh, as said previously, the typical IT department is buried under years of backlog, and pursuing, um, pushing even more resources to, uh, toward IT is not a reasonable proposition as it backfires by inflating further the expectations of the other departments. In turn, this further inflate the backlog. Um, on the contrary, the supply chain scientists paved the way to a uh, decrease of the expectations from IT. Uh, the scientist only expects raw data extracts to be made available. All the data crunching battles are up to the scientist. He expects nothing from IT on those fronts. Um, the scientist should not be seen as a corporate sanction flavor of shadow IT. It's about making um, the supply chain department responsible and accountable for its own core competency. The IT department manages the low-level infrastructure and the transactional layer. However, the supply chain decision layer should be entirely up to the supply chain department. For the IT, the IT department must be an enabler, not a decision maker, except for the truly IT-centric part of the business. Many IT departments are keenly aware of their own backlog and do embrace this new deal. However, if the instinct to protect what is perceived as their fiefdom is too strong, then IT can refuse to let go of the supply chain decision layer. Those situations are painful and in my experience can only be solved through the direct intervention of the CEO. From Afar, our conclusion will be that the role of the supply chain scientist can be seen as a modest, more specialized variation of the one of the data scientists. Historically, this was how Loka had attempted to fix issues associated with um, the corporate practice of data science. However, we realized a decade ago 
that this was insufficient. It took us years to gradually uncover um, all the elements that have been presented today. The supply chain scientist is not an add-on to the company in its supply chain. It's a clarification on the ownership of the mundane daily supply chain decisions. To get the most of this approach, the supply chain itself, or at the very least, its planning component has to be remodeled. Um, adjacent departments like finance or, and operation must also accommodate some change, also, although to a much lesser degree. Nurturing a team of supply chain scientists is a sizable commitment to, for the company, although when done properly, the productivity is high. In practice, each scientist ends up replacing 10 to 100 planners, forecasters, or inventory managers, netting huge payroll savings if those, um, even if those scientists individually command uh, higher salaries. The supply chain scientists illustrate a new deal with uh, IT by repositioning IT as an enabler rather than a solutioner. We remove many, if not most, uh, IT-related bottlenecks. Uh, more generally, this approach, the supply chain scientists, can be mirrored in all the other non-IT departments, uh, departments of the company. Marketing, sales, and finance comes to mind. Indeed, each one of those departments has its own mundane daily decisions to address. Those decisions would also extensively benefit from the same sort of automation. However, just like um, the supply chain scientist is first and foremost an expert of supply chain, the marketing scientist or marketing quant should first and foremost be an expert of marketing. The perspective of the scientist paves the way to make the most of the combination machine plus human intelligence in this early 21st century. The next lecture will be on the 10th of May. It will be a Wednesday at the same time of the day, 3 p.m. times of Paris. Today's lecture was non-technical. The next one will be largely technical. I will be presenting techniques for pricing optimization. Um, mainstream supply chain textbooks are typically not featuring pricing as an element of supply chain. However, pricing um, does substantially contribute to the balance of supply and demand. Also, pricing tend to be highly domain specific, um, as it is all too easy to incorrectly approach the challenge altogether uh, when thinking in abstract terms. Um, thus, we will narrow our investigations to the automotive aftermarket. This will be the occasion to revisit the elements brought forward with um, Stuttgart one of the supply chain person I introduced in the third chapter of this series of lectures. And now I will be uh, proceeding with um, the questions. A first question from Konstantin Avramenko. Again, sorry if I am mispronouncing those names, I, I, I'm terribly sorry. Um, it took academia almost a decade to figure out that data science field, that uh, the data science field has emerged and that they should teach it at high school. Um, do you already see the same happening in supply chain academia um, circles with adopting supply chain the su supply chain scientist perspective? Um, so, um, okay, let's re reframe a little bit. So first, I'm, I'm not aware of data science being, teach, uh, being taught in high schools <laughs> in France. Uh, they, 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 barely touch, they, they barely teach anything that is computer related in high school at all, let alone data science. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not too sure where they would even found the professors, the, you know, the high school teachers to, to, to do that. Um, but uh, I can understand that you want in high school to have some, uh, I would say, uh, some digital proficiency, uh, but I would, I, I don't, I think it, it I mean, my, I, I do have a daughter that is 12 years old. I believe that, you know, 
um, getting familiar with programming is a very good thing. You can do it, you know, even earlier from my own experience was from the age of seven, eight. It really depends on the maturity of the child. You can do it even in primary school. But we are talking of, you know, just basic programming concepts, just having, you know, variables, um, list of instructions, these sort of things. Um, I, I, I believe that, you know, data science is largely exceed the sort of things that you, that should be taught at high school, I mean, unless you have like prodigies or something. Um, uh, it is, for me, it is clearly something that is for people that are, you know, at, at, uh, at university level. Either uh, undergraduate or graduate, both are possible, but uh, now, the thing is, indeed, it took academia a decade to, you know, uh, put data science forward, but let's, uh, let's pause for a moment, you know, I, I, I described that, you know, data science as a corporate practice, which is pretty much, you know, the mirror version of what academia does while teaching uh, data science, um, is dismal, that the results are dismal. So, so we, we need to pause and think, okay, what is the problem? And, and here, I think one of the problem is that it is incredibly difficult to teach something that you don't practice, you know, and at least at university level. If, if below that, it's fine. But at university level, it is very difficult. So what I see is that we have already a problem with this data science is that people who are teaching data science are not the people who are actually doing data science in places that matter. And I don't mean, you know, um, your bank that pretend to be, you know, modern or whatever and say we, we are doing data science. I, I mean, doing data science in the places that are putting the, pushing the field forward, you know, the uh, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, you know, OpenAI and whatnot, uh, the, the places where the stuff is really happening. So, so that's the problem. And then uh, I think for supply chain, uh, we, um, we have a similar problem. And um, I don't know, I mean, it, it will obviously, having access to the people with the right e uh, expense is just incredibly difficult. And um, I hope, and by the way, look at, but that's, that's, that I would say, uh, that's a shameless plug of mine, LOCAD will start in the coming weeks in trying to provide some uh, materials intended for um, supply chain degrees. So we will start to, pu to push some materials that are really packaged in a way that should make them, uh, you know, appropriate for um, professors in academia so that they can, you know, roll out those insights. I mean, obviously, uh, they, 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 they will have to use their own, as they usually, as they always do, own judgment to assess whether you know those materials that are that locals end up pushing are actually worth being taught to students. A second question from uh, Konstantin uh, Avramenko uh, is: Locad uses a domain-specific language that is not used elsewhere beyond Locad. How do you motivate potential new hires to learn something that they will likely never use again in their next job? That is exactly the point that I was making about, you see, the problem that I had with data scientists. People were literally, when applying, saying, I want to do TensorFlow. You know, I am a TensorFlow guy. And now you have other people that apply and say, I'm a PyTorch guy. And sorry, this is not, this is not, uh, this is, this is not the right attitude. You know, if you confuse your identity with the sort of technical tools, um, you're just missing the point. The, the, what is really the challenge? Um, just, I said, you know, at, in this very lecture, I said it takes six months for a supply chain scientist to gain proficiency so that this person can maintain a recipe. It takes two years so that this person can come up with a recipe uh, from, um, uh, engineered from scratch. How much time does it take to be completely proficient with Envision? In our own experience, it takes three weeks. Three weeks compared to two years to be able to come up with an end-to-end -end, uh, numerical recipe. So you see, um, Envision, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a detail. It's a, it's a small detail. It has its importance because if your tooling is crap, obviously you're, you're going to face immense accidental problems. But let's be realistic. It is a very small piece. And, uh, I and the people who spend time at LOCAD 
um, they will learn immensely, but it's, it's about those supply chain problems. How do you quantitatively address uh, those problems so that you can generate production grade decisions, you know? And as I, in, in my series of lectures, yes, we have this, um, this, uh, uh, this proprietary programming language, uh, but everything could be rewritten, you know, with usually, I mean, that's, that's my own bias perspective with something like 10 times more lines of code, but, uh, but it could be rewritten in other languages. And also what people really don't, don't always re realize, especially the, the young people, you know, the, the young engineers fresh out of the university, is how transient are all those technologies. They, they, they don't last long. I mean, they, don't, they just last a couple of years and then they're gone. Um, when I started LOCAD, people were telling me, you, LOCAD cannot operate without R, the language, you know, R, the, the statistical language. If, if, I mean, all the good stuff is in R. You have to do that, this is the standard. If you don't do that, you're doomed. I didn't do R. And then two years after, it was a dupe. Oh no, you cannot, you have, you have data, you have data to process, you have to do it at scale. I mean, if you're not using Hadoop, Hadoop is the standard. If you don't do that, you're dead. And then it was um, Scikit. And then people were saying to me, but if, if you don't use Scikit, then you're dead. I mean, you have to use Scikit. I mean, it, all the good stuff is in Scikit. Two years later, uh, then uh, everything, now you have to use pandas. Okay, pandas, okay, it's yet another thing. You have to use pandas. If you don't use pandas, uh, you have a problem. All the good stuff is done through pandas and, uh, and et cetera. And now it, it has TensorFlows, PR, um, PyTorch, and now, by the way, pandas are now on the verge of being, uh, on, on being obsolete as if you look at uh, the, the, the community right now is pushing for um, Julia as a programming language, which is quite a superior approach to Python, but also if you're just looking at the equivalent of pandas, you have polars, which is a, a re-implementation in Rust of the, those data frames, vastly superior to, uh, to pandas. So the bottom, leg, the, the bottom line is we have an endless series of technologies, you know, and if when you're faced with a candidate, this candidate says, you know, what I really care about is a technical detail of um, uh, uh, in the way you approach the problem, then probably this candidate is not a very good candidate. And that was my problem, you know, with those data scientists is that that was a problem of attitude. They want the fancy stuff, you know, they, they want the bleeding edge emphasis on bleeding. Uh, supply chains are immensely complex systems. When you do a mistake, it can cost millions. You need stuff that is production grade. I mean, using the, 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 the latest super bleeding edge package uh, that you found on whatever Python forum discussion yesterday is not a good idea. It's not a good idea. It's a, it's a recipe to have this piece of software blow in your face in production. Um, so you see, again, it's not, and this criticism of, of using LOCAD is that even if LOCAD was not using, you know, Envision was not a proper language, uh, instead of using Envision, we had our own incredibly specific way to code in Python, because that would be, have been a, a, an alternative, you know, to just define exceedingly precise guideline on how to approach the problem in, guide, in, in Python. The problem would have been the same. It would have proved to be immensely frustrating for candidates if those candidates expect to be able to throw whatever, you know, cool software pieces happen, uh, happen to be featured on Hacker News yesterday. Um, we, uh, thus, thus, you see, the way we, ha we, we, mit we mitigate this problem is that the very best candidates, they don't really care. I mean, again, the very best candidates are people who have the genuine, you know, interest to, to become supply chain professional. The important part is supply chain. It is not, you know, the, 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 the details on the programming language. Another question from Courtney Albert. I am pursuing a bachelor degree in supply chain transportation and logistic management. How can I become a supply chain scientist? Well, first, I encourage, uh, that's a shameless plug of me, but just, you know, uh, drop us your resume, you know, apply. We have positions that are open at all time. But um, more seriously, you see, the gist, the gist of the supply chain scientist is to have an opportunity, a company 
that is willing to automate its supply chain decisions. You know, that's, that's the gist of it. All the rest is all the uh, technical necessities to make this, uh, numer this, this recipe work super smoothly in production. But that's that the gist of it is having the opportunity. So how do you create this opportunity? I mean, one way is apply at LOCAD, get hired, and then you, know, you, you will be uh, onboarded as a supply chain scientist. Um, another way is to find a company, convince them that you know, having this ownership of the decision, that's what I presented today, the biggest, most important item in uh, the, this supply chain scientist, and I'm sorry for this terminology, is this ownership part, is, is to own the decisions. So if you can find a company that is willing to you know, give a serious try at, uh, at this perspective, um, you know, then then I think it will go a very, very long way to, for you to become a, a scientist just because you will become one out of necessity. You will see that um, production greediness commands a lot of the stuff that I'm pushing in this series of lectures. This is not an option. You will realize that when you're facing your production and that the stuff that you code will go in, produ in production and that tomorrow you will drive millions of dollars worth of inventory, of orders, of stock movement, and that if you make a mistake, it will cost millions to the company. I mean, you will realize what, what um, we are talking about, about this, this, this immense responsibility and this, the need for correctness by design. So that's, you know, that's one way. And um, I'm pretty sure that other companies, you know, hopefully, LOCAD will grow and acquire many more opportunities. But, um, uh, but in, even in my wildest dream, I, ca I don't think, uh, I, I can't you know, hope that every single company on Earth will be leveraging LOCAD. There will be plenty of, of companies that will always decide to do it their way and, and, and will be just fine. A question from um, Saifullah Waspada. Since 40% of the uh, supply chain scientists' daily routine is coding, which programming language would you suggest for undergraduate students to learn first, particularly studying management? Um, whatever is readily accessible. Um, Python is a good start. Uh, my suggestion is to actually try several programming languages. Uh, uh, you know, Typically, what you expect from one supply chain engineer is pretty much the opposite. From one, for, for people who want to become supply chain, for, for people who want to become software engineers, my default advice is pick one language and go super deep, super deep. Like, like really, you know, all the nanny and crooks of this thing um, so that you realize that all the deepness that there is. And that's true for no matter which language do you, do you pick. But for people who are ultimately generalist, I would say do a little bit, I would do, do the opposite. Um, you know, do a little bit of SQL, a little bit of Python, a little bit of R, uh, pay attention a little bit to the syntax of Excel. Stry, uh, ev eventually, um, you know, have a look. You don't necessarily have to do much, but try to have a look at, at languages that are uh, maybe like ASCO or Rust or whatever, just, again, not programming, just, just to have a look at the documentation, just to see a little bit uh, how it looked like. So my suggestion would be uh, pick whatever, whatever you have uh, accessible. Uh, by the way, LOCAD uh, has, stay tuned, LOCAD we, has some plans that will unfold, you know, in, literally in the coming weeks to make uh, Envision readily accessible to um, students uh, for free, uh, graciously. Um, so stay tuned, that's, that's our plan. So maybe, you know, a couple of weeks from now, you will be able to actually use Envision if you want, uh, free of charge. Uh, but, but more generally, any language would do, and I would suggest actually to survey a little bit so that you can get a sense of what is there. Um, and you don't have to fall in love with any solution in particular uh, that, you know, there will be time once you are in a given position to really learn uh, the specifics of whatever programming environment you end up using. A question from uh, Narasim Hamurti Adavi. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, um, do you see GraphDB going to have to, uh, going um, to be the next big thing impact on supply chain predictions? Um, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, so 
graph, uh, graph database have been around, uh, have been around for, uh, for more than two decades. Um, the leader is Neo4G. Uh, I mean, on first contact, a graph database is, you know, a coolish component. Uh, it is, it is, you know, it is unusual. So it, it captures your interest, at least if you're like me, you know, um, very much into uh, the geeky stuff. So uh, my first contact with Neo4G two decades ago was, oh, this is cool. This is something that is so different from um, a, a regular um, uh, relational database. But my experience, I've seen, you know, dozens of companies trying to use those sort of database. They are just not very good. Um, uh, um, especially, especially, it's not that Neo4G is not a good product, by the way, and there are you know half a dozen of other graph databases. It's not that they are not good products. The the challenge is that they are relational databases that are so incredibly good, you know, compared to that. Uh, PostgreSQL is probably one of the most incredibly good piece of software of engineering that is out there. You know, PostgreSQL is a, a diamond. Um, and and um, and frankly, even MariaDB, you know, the successor of uh, of, of MySQL. I mean, it, it's it's very good either. It, it's it's very good also. So it's it's literally the, the bar. The problem is that you know uh, the, those graph databases they are good, but the relational database, the very best open source relational database, are so incredibly good that yeah, it, it's not that good. Then for supply chain predictions, frankly, this is not a matter. I mean. Uh, having some graph-like operators is, is, is not what it takes. Um, uh, in this series of lectures, if you, if you go back to the fifth chapter, you will see what sort of techniques did actually, you know, is winning the forecasting competition. And if you look at the top people that in the, let's say, the M5, the last, um, uh, the, the forecasting competition that was using Walmart data set, none of the people that was in the top 100 the, it has been using a graph database, none. And if you look at the M6, which is the, the latest iteration, but that's a finance data set, it's the same thing. I mean, graph database do not contribute to, um, to, to, to prediction. I'm sorry, it's just, I mean, it's a cool piece of technology, don't make me wrong, it's interesting, but it doesn't. Um, then if I were to go into the, the graph angle, uh, if you want to go into the graph angle, then there are things that can be done um, uh, from a deep learning perspective with um, uh, with graph network and uh, and 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 graph. I would say with deep learning applied to graph. Um, by the way, um, if if you want to have an example of that of a graph approach with I would say stochastic gradient descent and differentiable programming. Um, there will be an hopefully an example of that in, in my next lecture, the one about pricing. I will be illustrating how you can use differentiable programming to do some kind of graph analytics. And it's very interesting because it's also for um, prediction slash optimization of, of, of pricing. So in the next lecture, you will see that we can do graph analytics with differentiable programming, but you will see that it has nothing to do, again, with um, what is commonly understood as a, 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 a graph database. A question from uh, De uh, Betancourt. Um, do you think that the supply chain scientist should be involved in the goal definition among a customer data science project? Um, so let me unpack a little bit this, this question. First, you see that there is, there is something, there is a problem in, in, in this sort of underlying assumption that, that goes into this question. A data science project. You see, that's, that was my problem. Data science as a corporate practice is this small. It doesn't work. You, know? that's, you, you, you focus on data science before focusing on what the hell, what is the problem are we even trying to solve? So you see, um, so the, 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 the scientists should be involved in the goal definition. However, the other part of your question is very, very relevant. Um, should the uh, supply chain scientist involved, and I am rephrasing your um, your question, into the goal definition of um, the supply chain optimization, I would say yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, having the scientist, you know, uncovering what is it that we truly want is difficult. And by the way, uh, if you think, for example, that 
pricing is just about figuring out what is the right price, <laughs> you might be uh, in, uh, you might be in for uh, quite a big surprise. So again, stay tuned for the next, um, next lecture. But you see, understanding what is the problem that we are trying to solve is the journey you know, uh, of, of the supply chain scientists. So should the scientists be on board for that? Absolutely, it is absolutely critical. However, let's clarify that it's, it's not a data science initiative, it is a supply chain initiative that happened accidentally to, um, to be able to, you know, uh, to, to use data because it is a suitable uh, ingredient for the initiative. But you see, that's the other way around. We really need to start from the supply chain problems, the supply chain ambition, and then it happens that as we want to make the most of modern software, we need this scientist. But you see, that's a different way, and this scientist will help you to polish your understanding of the problem further because the line of demarcation between what is feasible in software and what and what remains you know strictly the domain of the human intelligence is, is kind of fuzzy and you need the scientists to you know navigate this line of demarcation. Excellent. So um, see you um, two months from now in May, 10th of May, for the next lecture. We will be discussing about pricing. See you then.